A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 14th of October 2023. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I would ask every viewers to subscribe to our channel. When you subscribe to our channel, you can get immediate updates whenever we post a new video. That is why we are asking you to subscribe and share it maximum with your friends. So we'll move on to the announcement of the day. The first announcement is regarding the Indian Express newspaper analysis. The Indian Express weekly newspaper analysis will be publishing on every Sunday. So do watch it and record your feedbacks in the comment section. And also share it with your friends regarding the initiative. It will be very helpful to gain knowledge in a different perspective. Now the second announcement is regarding our prelims 2024 test series. Second batch of pre-storming 2024 will be starting tomorrow, that is 15th October 2023. Tomorrow there will be an orientation for the test and you will have the first test on 22nd October 2023. We all know that preliminary examination is getting tougher year on year. So use this chance wisely and get yourself registered before the test begins. Remember tomorrow the orientation will be starting. Okay. So with these two important announcements, let us move on to the newspaper analysis. Take a look at this news article. Yesterday, a panel discussion was organized by the Madras School of Economics under the title Life and Work of M.S. Swaminathan. In the panel discussion, various aspects of Mr. M.S. Swaminathan's life were discussed, mainly his role in India's Green Revolution. As you all know, it was the Green Revolution that transformed our country to a bread basket. Today, we shall see some of the basics of Green Revolution and we shall also discuss a question related to it. So, what was the objective of Green Revolution? See, the primary objective was to increase food production and productivity, especially wheat and rice. Through this, India aimed at achieving self-sufficiency in food production. The other important objectives include adoption of modern techniques, addressing hunger and increasing agricultural employment. As you can see in this graph, India's food production increased tremendously due to green revolution. Due to increased food production, India became self-sufficiency in food grain production. The increased productivity also helped the farmers economically. Many big land owners, mainly in Punjab and Haryana region, became extremely rich. Also, agriculture allied sectors like fertilizer industry, tractor industry, pump industry witnessed a growth. So, it is safe to say that Green Revolution transformed India as a bread basket. But has the Green Revolution addressed hunger in India? The answer to this is no. Even after having surplus agricultural production year after year, food insecurity and hunger still prevails in India. This is popularly termed as India's hunger paradox. So let us understand India's hunger paradox using a mains question. Now look at this question. Despite having self-sufficiency in food production, India still faces the challenges of hunger and food security. Throw light upon the factors causing these challenges and suggest measures that the government can take for the same. See the question is very straightforward. The examiner is asking us to write about the reasons as to why hunger and food security persist in India even after attaining self-sufficiency in food production. Then we have to write about the steps taken by the government to ensure food security. It is a very simple question and let us try to answer it. So let's start with the introduction. See to write the introduction, my suggestion is we can substantiate the statement given in the question. That is, we have to give some data about India, especially self-sufficiency in food production. And then we have to give some data about the hunger situation in India. First, let me give you some data regarding India's food production. See, India's food grain production in the years immediately after independence was around 50 million tons. This has increased exponentially over the years. According to Economic Survey 2022-23, to India's Food grain production touched a record 315.7 million tons in 221 to 22. 
in addition to this india's pulse production touched 23.8 million tons then india's horticulture production touched 342.3 million tons so these data show that india's food production increased over the years and has become self sufficient now let me share you some data with you regarding india's hunger situation according to global hunger index 2023 india ranks 111 out of a total of 125 countries although india has improved in the past couple of years india still falls in the serious hunger category now few data is regarding hunger from nfhs5 nfhs5 introduced a category called zero food zero food is a scenario in which people have not had any food 24 hours preceding the survey according to the nfhs5 the zero food prevalence was 30 percentage for infant aged 6 to 11 months for infants in the 12 to 17 month old age group zero food prevalence is worsely high at 13 percentage so you can highlight any of these specific data for the hunger situation in india remember these were just examples it is not necessary to write everything you can remember any two important fact and write it in your introduction so now coming to the main body of the answer firstly we have to cover the challenges in ensuring food security in india see every aspirant even the non serious ones will be able to write a decent answer highlighting the challenges in ensuring food security in india now how can we differentiate your answer and make it look special the answer to this is subheadings so moving forward i will discuss challenges in ensuring food security in india under various subheadings like policy challenges administrative challenges economic challenges and social challenges see using subheadings will give structure to your answer and it will also help you generate points it will also make you to stand unique in your presentation as well so let's see the policy challenges here you can mention about india's faulty pds system see the pds system in india faces various challenges like faulty identification of beneficiaries that has resulted in exclusion errors leakage corruption and reducing storage capacity due to this even though there is excess food production it does not reach the intended beneficiaries then you can mention about the issues with rural infrastructure here you can highlight improper irrigation facilities lack of cold storage facilities and inadequate market linkages due to this food wastage is very high in india according to the fss ai food safety and security authority of india one third of all food in india is wasted or gets spoiled before it is eaten This is another reason why the increase in food production in India did not result in a reduction in hunger. Finally, you can mention about the negatives of the Green Revolution and the faulty MSP policy. See, the Green Revolution focused only on food crops, mainly rice and wheat. Farmers also preferred growing only rice and wheat. India's MSP policy also gives unhealthy preference to rice and wheat. This has resulted in monoculture of rice and wheat all over the country. Due to this diversity in populations, food consumption has reduced. This has resulted in an increase in the hidden hunger that is malnutrition. According to NFHS 5, 35.5 percent of children are stunted in India, 19 percent are wasted, and 32 percent are underweight. So these are the policy challenges. Moving on to the administrative challenges. In this first, you can highlight the issue of corruption and mismanagement. See, according to Transparency International's Corruption Perceptions Index 2022. India ranked 85th out of 180 countries indicating the persistence of corruption within the country corruption in the administrative framework is the main reason for diversion of resources black marketing and the exclusion of eligible beneficiaries this is one reason why hunger is still prevalent in india then you can mention about bureaucratic inefficiencies bureaucratic inefficiency acts as a hurdle to the timely execution of food security programs this can lead to delays in the distribution of food grains and other essential commodities to the intended beneficiaries 
Finally, you can mention inefficient monitoring mechanism. As you all know, inadequate monitoring and evaluation of various food security programs can result in the mismanagement of resources and inefficient implementation. So these are all the administrative challenges. Then moving on to the economic challenges. In this first, you can mention about poverty in our country. According to World Bank in 2021, around 21.9 percentage of the Indian population was below the national poverty line. This economic challenge directly impacts the ability of vulnerable populations to access essential food items leading to food insecurity and malnutrition. Then there is the issue of price volatility. Fluctuations in food prices can lead to affordability issues, particularly for low-income households. Finally, let us take up the social challenges to ensuring food security. In this, first you can mention gender disparity. See, culturally, women are neglected in India. The unspoken law of traditional India households is to first allocate food for men, followed by children. Women are often expected to feed themselves with what is left. Due to this, malnutrition and hunger are prevalent among women in India. Next is the issue of social inequality and marginalization. Caste-based discrimination can limit access to food and nutrition. According to NFHS 5 data, disparities in malnutrition rates persist across different socio-economic groups with marginalized communities often experiencing high rates of malnutrition. So these are the reasons for India's hunger paradox. And these are the reasons why India is not able to achieve the SDG goal 2 that is ensuring zero hunger despite being self-sufficient in food production. So having addressed the first part of the question, let us take up the second part that is the steps taken by the government. See, in this, first you can mention about the National Food Security Act 2013. Through this, our government addresses food insecurity by ensuring accessibility, availability and affordability of food grains. Next, you can mention about Poshan 2.0. It is an umbrella scheme under Ministry of Women and Child Development. It not only addresses food security, but also ensures nutritional security and also creates awareness regarding this. Through this, the government aims to address various issues like stunting, undernutrition, anemia and low birth weight. Then there is midday meal scheme. This program provides free healthy meals to school children. This scheme helps increase nutrition intake and encourage school attendance. The scheme also ensures both food security and nutrition security. Then you can mention Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yochana PMMVY is a maternity benefit program that provides cash incentives to pregnant and lactating mothers. This scheme helps improve nutrition and health during pregnancy and after childbirth. The next one is Poshan Vatika. This scheme mainly focuses on addressing nutrition insecurity. Under the scheme, people are encouraged to grow vegetables in their backyard to diversify their diet. Finally, you can even link the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, NREGA, here. NREGA provides employment opportunities to rural households, ensuring income stability and improving the purchasing power of vulnerable communities. This, in turn, enhances their access to food and other essential commodities. So, these are various steps taken by government to ensure food security in India. Now, coming to the conclusion part. See, in the conclusion part, you can mention that only by addressing the challenges, India can achieve its dream of zero hunger. Only by achieving zero hunger can our country create an efficient human capital and ensure social stability. This will help India realize its full demographic dividend and become a superpower. So, this will be a reasonable conclusion. I hope we have addressed the question efficiently and learned a lot about India's hunger paradox and government initiatives to address it. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. According to the news article, yesterday the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization CDSCO, gave approval for India's first chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy product, in short called as 
கார் டீ செல் தெரப்பி ப்ராடக்ட் ஸோ இது கார் டீ தெரப்பி இஸ் யூஸ்டு டு ட்ரீட் பிளட் கேன்சர் அண்ட் திஸ் இஸ் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் டைம் த கார் டீ செல் தெரப்பி ப்ராடக்ட் வாஸ் சக்ஸஸ்ஃபுல்லி மேனுஃபேக்சர்ட் இன் இந்தியா திஸ் ப்ராடக்ட் வாஸ் மேனுஃபேக்சர்டு பை த மும்பை பேஸ்ட் கம்பெனி நேம்ட் இமினோ அடாப்டிவ் செல் தெரப்பி ப்ரைவேட் லிமிடெட் As the product received the approval from CDSEO, it will revolutionize blood cancer treatment in India. This is about the news article given here. So in this discussion, let us understand the process involved in the CAR T-cell therapy. See, as I said earlier, CAR T-cell therapy is used to treat blood cancer. Know that blood cancer affects the production and function of our body cells. There are three main types of blood cells in our body. which includes red blood cells white blood cells and platelets see each of these blood cells carry out different functions for example the red blood cell carry oxygen from lung and deliver it throughout our body then white blood cell act as an immune system to fight off infections and finally platelets help in the clotting of blood remember most of the blood cells in our body are produced in the bone marrow So what is a bone marrow? It is the soft spongy material present in the center of the bones. Note that the bone marrow produces about 95% of the body's blood cells. If you ask how the blood is produced, firstly a single type of unspecialized cells called stem cells originate within the bone marrow. Over time these unspecialized stem cells in our bone marrow get matured and they develop into three types of blood cells like red blood cell white blood cell and platelets this is how blood cells in our body are produced so now let's see how blood cancer affect the production and function of blood cells see basically blood cancer affects the normal blood cell growth process so if a person has a blood cancer there is uncontrollable growth of abnormal blood cells in the blood marrow that is the stem cells are developed into blood cells before the maturing process these cells are called the abnormal cells or cancerous cells these cancerous cells in turn start to divide into many other abnormal cells and there is no control in this process so many abnormal or cancerous cells are mixed into the blood stream see these abnormal blood cells are very dangerous to our body This is because they prevent our blood from performing many of its functions. For example, the abnormal white blood cell could not fight off infections or the abnormal platelets could not prevent serious bleeding. So this creates serious health complications in our body like fever, internal bleeding, shortage of blood, headache and so on. Most of the time blood cancer ends up in death. as there is no control over the growth of abnormal or cancerous cell so this is about blood cancer now let's see the process involved in car t cell therapy first of all know that car t cell therapy uses the t lymphocytes or t cells to treat blood cancer that is why the therapy got the name car t cell therapy know that t lymphocytes or t cells are a type of white blood cell they help our immune system to fight germs and protect us from disease see the t cells in our body continuously monitor for any intruder like virus or bacteria by tackling the unique type of proteins called antigens basically antigens are located on the surface of virus or bacteria so when t cells identify any antigen of the intruder the t cell block them with the use of receptors The receptors is nothing but a kind of protein present in the T cells. The receptors are like antivirus software on our computer. When T cells sense intruder antigen in our body, they use their receptors to catch and block the intruder. Ultimately, T cells will kill the intruder cells. By doing this function, the T cell help to fight off germs and protect us from disease. See this application of T cell is only used in CAR T cell therapy. So firstly blood is collected from blood cancer patient. After that T cells are separated and removed from the collected blood. Then the obtained T cells are genetically altered. The altered cells will now have specific receptors called chimeric antigen receptors CAR. These altered cells are called CAR T cells. 
See the receptors present in the CAR T cells are able to attack and kill cancerous cell. Now after the generation of CAR T cells, they are kept under certain conditions. It enables the CAR T cells to multiply into millions of cells. After this process, these numerous CAR T cells are introduced into the bloodstream of the blood cancer patient. After entering the bloodstream, the CAR T cell fight off the cancerous cell and help to cure cancerous cell. So this is how CAR T cell therapy actually works. So I think you got a clear idea about the blood cancer and CAR T cell therapy. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this article, it talks about curative petition. See Supreme Court has accepted the curative petition for Maratha Reservation Law. Chief Justice of India has mentioned that this curative petition will be considered at the appropriate time. Remember earlier the review petition was dismissed by the court but currently a curative petition on the matter has been accepted. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us understand the difference between special leave petition, review petition, curative petition and mercy petition. So let us see about them one by one. First, we will see about special leave petition. See in some cases, people appeal to the Supreme Court when they are unhappy with the High Court's judgment. However, there is a special provision in Article 136 of the Constitution under which one can directly appeal to the Supreme Court. This means you can appeal to Supreme Court to review decisions made by any court or tribunal in the country. It's important to note that the Supreme Court has the discretion to decide whether or not to grant permission for such appeals. Generally, SLPs are filed in cases involving significant question of law issues of public importance or to challenge decisions that may have violated fundamental rights. So remember special leave petition provides the aggrieved party a special permission to be heard in apex court in appeal against any judgment or order of any court or tribunal in the territory of India. Also the grant of SLP is not a matter of right. Supreme Court can either accept or deny SLP. So this is about the SLP. Now moving on to review petition. See a review petition is used to request a review of a judgment or order of a court seeking correction of any errors, omissions or miscarriage of justice. It is filed in the same court that issued the original judgment. For example, if a judgment was given by a division bench of the Supreme Court, the review petition is filed in the same division bench. A review petition is generally considered based on specific grounds like errors of law, factual inaccuracies or issues that were not addressed during the original trial. Note that review petition should be filed within 30 days of the judgment. So this is about review petition. Now we shall see about curative petition. See, curative petition is filed after a review petition has been rejected. The primary purpose of a curative petition is to ensure that gross miscarriage of justice are rectified. Note that it is only available in the Supreme Court. A curative petition is usually heard by the three senior most judges of Supreme Court along with the judges who delivered the judgment under review. Also, the decision to admit a curative petition is at the discretion of the judges. So this is about the curative petition. Moving on to the mercy petition. See, a mercy petition is a petition filed by a person who has been convicted and sentenced to do death. It is addressed to the president of India or the governor of a state. The purpose of a mercy petition is to seek a commutation or pardon of the death sentence. It is typically based on humanitarian grounds, mental health issues or other considerations. The president or governor upon receiving a mercy petition may either grant clemency, commute the sentence or reject the petition. So this is all about the different types of petitions. Now let's look at the main difference between these four petitions. See the first difference is about jurisdiction. SPL and curative petition are filed before Supreme Court. Review petition is filed at the same court that issued the original judgment. Whereas the mercy petition is filed before president or governor. 
this is the first difference second difference is about grounds slp is used to appeal on significant question of law issues of public importance or violation of fundamental rights a curative petition is filed for seeking correction of errors omissions or miscarriage of justice whereas review petition is filed for reviewing errors of law factual inaccuracies or issues that were not addressed during the original trial now the third difference is about the order of filing see first a review petition is filed then one can go for curative petition and lastly the mercy petition is filed this is the order in which petitions are filed so these are the major difference between these petitions with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this article it talks about speaker's decision on anti defection law see the speaker of maharashtra state assembly was warned by the supreme court for not taking action on anti defection proceedings against mlas this is the crux of the article given here so in this context let us learn some of the basics of anti defection law see the anti defection law comes under the 10th schedule of the constitution it was introduced in 1985 because there was the issue of frequent political defections in india legislators previously used to to switch parties for personal gain or to destabilize governments so the anti defection law was brought in with the aim to prevent legislators from switching parties it seeks to promote party discipline and stability in the functioning of the government the law lays down the process by which legislators may be disqualified on grounds of defection note that this law applies to both the parliament and state assemblies now who can decide upon the decision of disqualification it is the presiding officer of the house he decides on the matter of disqualification note that the decision of the presiding officer to disqualify a member is subjected to judicial review very important point the law initially stated that the decision of the presiding officer is not subjected to judicial review but this condition was stuck down by the supreme court in 1992 itself so these are all some of the basic informations that you have to remember about anti defection law now we shall see about the grounds for defection under this law firstly if they voluntarily give up the membership of their party they will be disqualified by the speaker under this anti defection law secondly if they disobey the directives of the party leadership this means that if a legislator defies the party whip on any issue they can lose their membership of the house thirdly if any nominated member joins any political party after the end of 6 months he may be disqualified let me explain this let's say there is a nominated mp a now a wants to join a political party after a period of 6 months this goes against the provision of the anti defection law so the mp will be disqualified so these are the grounds on which members of legislature are disqualified under anti defection law but there are certain exceptions to the law this means legislators may change their party without the risk of disqualification in certain circumstances see the law allows a party to merge with another party if at least 2/3 of its members are in favor of the merger you should note one thing here in such a scenario if such a merger happens neither the members who decide to merge nor the ones who stay with the original party will face disqualification but one major drawback of this law is that it restricts a legislator from voting in lines with his conscience judgments and interest of his electorate so these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about anti defection it is a potential preliminary and main topic make note of it so these learned points and now let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this article about the onset of northeast monsoon the northeast monsoon is expected to start between october 23 and 25 as the southwest monsoon is retreating the conditions are turning favorable to northeast monsoon so in this news article today let us revise some of the basics about northeast monsoon and its rainfall distribution see the northeast monsoon usually occurs in india from october to december it is characterized by the winds blowing from the northeast which is why it is called the northeast monsoon 
in this type of monsoon the wind blows from the sea to the land so this is the reason why it is called retreating monsoon now let us see the major factors responsible for the formation of northeast monsoon firstly the formation and strengthening of high pressure system over tibetan plateau and siberian plateau in winter secondly the westward migration and weakening of the high pressure system in the southern indian ocean thirdly the migration of itcz to the south of india during winter here itcz or intertropical convergence zone is a belt of low pressure which circles the earth near the equator it is the zone where the trade winds of the northern and southern hemisphere merges ITCZ follows the sun so that the position varies seasonally it moves north in the northern summer and south in the northern winter now let us discuss the role of these factors in detail see during summer sun's position is apparently over the tropic of cancer this results in low pressure and high temperature in central asia at the same time pressure over indian ocean is sufficiently high due to the differential heating of land and water so winds flow from the ocean to the land mass this results in southwest monsoon but in winter sun's apparent position is vertically over the tropic of capricorn so the land mass develops high pressure while oceans develop low pressure so the flow of monsoon is reversed to form northeast monsoon now which are the areas affected by this northeast monsoon in india see this monsoon primarily affects the southern and eastern part of india it includes states like tamil nadu andhra pradesh karnataka and also parts of kerala and odisha it is especially significant for the coastal regions along the bay of bengal tamil nadu's main rainy season that is 48 percentage of its annual rainfall is received during this northeast monsoon so talking about the impacts of northeast monsoon see the timing of this monsoon is critical for agricultural activities primarily for crops like rice the monsoon also has a cooling effect on the coastal regions of south india northeast monsoon is also associated with the formation of cyclones in the bay of bengal this can bring heavy rainfall and sometimes cause damage to the coastal regions So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about northeast monsoon. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now the news article here is that Directorate of Vigilance and Anti Corruption DVAC has registered a case against the Tamil Nadu Teachers Recruitment Board TRB secretary. So in this context let us revise some basic points regarding Central Vigilance Commission CVC. CVC was established in February 1964. It was established on the recommendation of Santanam Committee on Prevention of Corruption. See, it consists of a Central Vigilance Commissioner and two Vigilance Commissioners. Initially, it was constituted by a resolution. Then, it gained statutory status in the year 1998 through an ordinance. However, at present, it is a statutory body established under the Central Vigilance Commission Act of 2003. So why was this organization established see the organization was established to address corruption in the country based on the santanam committee recommendation the government decided to establish an apex vigilance institution and this institution would be free of control from any executive authority this lead to the creation of central vigilance commission or cvc Remember the CVC does not come under any ministry it is basically an independent body which is answerable or responsible only to the parliament okay so what are the roles played by CVC the CVC monitors all vigilance activity under the central government it also advises various authorities in central government organizations in their vigilance work then CVC receives complaints on corruption or misuse of office and recommends appropriate action Here you should know that CVC is not an investigation agency. The investigation is either done through the CBI or through Central Vigilance Officers (CVO) in government offices. The CVC looks into the offences committed by certain categories of government officers under the Prevention of Corruption Act, 1988. The commission is vested with the powers of superintendents over the CBI's functioning. 
as far it relates to the prevention of corruption act 1988 and in general it has a superintendence of vigilance administration in the central government and its organizations in 2013 the parliament enacted the lokpal and lokayukta act 2013 this act has amended the cbc act 2003 after the amendment the commission has been empowered to conduct preliminary inquiry and further investigation into complaints referred by the lokpal then as per whistle blowers act 2014 the cbc can also receive complaints about corruption from whistle blowers so these are all some of the functions of cbc moving on let us see the jurisdiction of cbc just look at this box these are the people who are placed under cbc's jurisdiction in addition to these the commission's jurisdiction also includes any company where the cumulative share of the central government is at least 51 percentage of paid up share capital from here we can be clear that the central vigilance commission does not deal with the matters pertaining to the state governments now let us see the appointment procedure of the central vigilance commissioner in the central vigilance commission see the appointment of cvc and vcs are as per the procedure laid down in section 4 of the cvc act 2003 the persons to be appointed will be selected by a selection committee chaired by the prime minister other members of this selection committee are union minister of home affairs and leader of opposition in the lok sabha after the recommendation of this selection committee the cvc and vcs will be appointed by the president by warrant under his or her hand and seal once the appointment is made both cvc and vcs should hold office for a term of 4 years or till they attain the age of 65 years whichever is earlier not that a vigilance commissioner is eligible for appointment as a central vigilance commissioner however the aggregate term of office in both post shall not be more than 4 years and also remember a central vigilance commissioner is ineligible for reappointment this provision is there mainly to ensure the service of the central vigilance commissioner without fear or favor so these are all some of the very important points that you have to remember about central vigilance commission make note of all these points so these learned points now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion which is the preliminary practice question discussion now take a look at this first question chimeric antigen receptor t cell car t cell therapy often in the news is used to treat which one of the following diseases or conditions so the correct answer here is option c blood cancer now look at this second question regarding cbc three statements are given and you have to find the correct statement here statement 1 says cbc is established on the recommendation of santanam committee this statement is actually correct now look at this second statement cbc has powers of superintendence over the cbi in all cases see this statement is actually incorrect cbc has powers of superintendence over the cbi in relation to prevention of corruption act 1988 not in all cases so this statement is incorrect look at this third statement whistle blowers can make complaints regarding corruption to the cbc this statement is correct so the correct answer for the question is option b only two only two statements are correct second statement is alone incorrect moving on here three factors are given you have to find which is responsible for the formation of southwest monsoon first is formation of high pressure system over tibetan and siberian plateau this statement is actually incorrect because formation of high pressure system over tibetan and siberian plateau is responsible for northeast monsoon and not southwest monsoon okay so the first statement is incorrect second statement says formation of permanent high pressure near madagascar in southern indian ocean this statement is correct third statement says indian ocean dipole this statement is also correct so the correct answer here is option b only 2 2 and 3 alone is correct here now moving on this question ask what is the primary purpose of curative petition in the indian legal system see so the correct answer for the question is option d to rectify severe errors or injustice in a court judgment after a review petition has been rejected now moving on look at this question about anti defection law you have to find which one of the following is not a ground for disqualification of an elected member 
So the correct answer for this is option D. Immediately joining another party after being elected as a member of a nominated party. See, if a nominated member joins any political party, only after the end of six months, he may be disqualified. So this statement is incorrect. So the correct answer for the question is option D. So that's all regarding this news article discussion. Once again, if you like the video, hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to our Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching.